Ladies and gentlemen, and those of you who are students in the classes that we share, I bring you greetings and blessings from the campus of North Shore Church of Christ. Once again, we've come before you to say a word relative to the Bible, the Biblos. Uh, during the last few days, many words are being said using the Bible, even in the House, in the house of Congress. People are using the Bible. <clears throat> in many instances, they are misapplying uh, the Scripture, but uh, I just will share with you what thus saith the Lord. Jesus said that ye shall know the truth, and it shall make you free. Uh, the great apostle Paul said, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed but handling aright uh, the Word of God. <clears throat> we love coming to you, and we pray that you are being uh, edified and your knowledge level is increasing because of your uh, working with us. I'm going to ask you to get your pencil, paper, and a copy of the Bible uh, for your study, or if you have it on your laptop or tablet or what have you, uh, that's okay, too. It's always good to have a Bible. Uh, that you can uh, uh, study along with us. Do not accept what I say, but accept what the Bible says. And what I say is just helping you to <clears throat> grasp what the writer of the Word intended to be said. Uh, as you know, the Bible is divided into two parts. There's the Old Testament and the New Testament. And of course, obviously, the New Testament has uh, is better than the old. The old is good. The old served its purpose. It's just like an old car. It serves its purpose, and then you get a new car, and the new car obviously will be better uh, than the old. The same is true with the Bible. The new covenant is better uh, than the old. We at North Shore Church of Christ welcome you with love. We're people loving to serve people. We all come from different backgrounds, different experiences, different lifestyles. But when we focus on Christ, over time we grow together, where we get to the point where we have the same mind and the same judgment. But it takes time. It takes patience. It does not happen overnight. You cannot, uh, you cannot be uh, chemical, chemically dependent today and then all of a sudden be into full sobriety tomorrow. It takes time and patience for the change, repentance to occur. <clears throat> and Jesus is merciful enough to give you some time in order to get it all together. But don't take too much time because his patience will wear out. <clears throat> People are dying every day. Some are dying of natural causes and others are dying of unnatural causes. Others are dying of being caused by other human beings. But let us certainly pray for one another that we'll be able <clears throat> to live our lives to the fullest such that the Lord can bless us with a heavenly reward because of our obedience to what he has said. Remember that our services on the Lord's Day, Sundays, start at 9 a.m. We welcome you to come and be with us, and I guarantee that you'll be better than you were when you came. When you leave, you'll be glad that you came, and then when you leave, you'll never forget the experience that you will have had in North Shore Church of Christ. We start at 9 a.m. on Sundays, all ages, for devotion, for worship, and for classes. And then uh, in the middle of the week on Wednesdays, we have uh, dual Bible classes, one in the morning at 9.30 a.m. for those who are not night drivers, and then we have one in the evening at 6.30 for those who maybe are working during the day and they need a midweek refueling. You know, we need to. One reason why we, we have midweek Bible class is for you to reconnect via the fellowship of other Christians to reconnect uh, with spiritual things because our lives are so full of secular, sinful things that uh, we need to always stay in touch with the Creator because ultimately... The Creator is the one that will determine our destination. We're so thankful once again to go to the Word and 
share with you another lesson. So let's get ready and let's study for a moment. <clears throat> there is something in our lives that is paramount. Uh, it is paramount. It, 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 it affects all of us. Uh, if you go back to the Garden of Eden, uh, the, the ideal conditions that God had placed Adam and Eve into, they messed that up. They, they, they ruined that because of one thing, and that's wanting something that they should not have had, possessions. Possessions is detrimental to all of us if we don't watch out. <clears throat> That's why I thought I would uh, share with you a lesson uh, in that area. Uh, and I, and, and the, the best place for me to go is go to Jesus and let him talk to us in that area. I'll go to Jesus and I'll go to those whom he inspired, Jesus as well as the Apostle Paul. I know some have discredited the Apostle Paul. They say that you know, Paul was not inspired or he was partly inspired. No, 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 no. Paul said, this is what Paul said in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 1. He said, it was revealed unto me. In other words, what Paul said, I, I didn't get it by my opinion or philosophy or going to school or my lifestyle. He said, it was revealed unto me. And then he said, I wrote in a few words, whereby when you read, you may understand the mystery. And of course, the mystery is concerning Christ himself. So Paul is saying, everything I wrote, it was revealed unto me. So in other words, Paul is an inspired writer. Peter is an inspired writer. Matthew is inspired. Mark is inspired. Luke is inspired. All of them are inspired writers in the New Testament as well as the Old Testament. All scripture is written by the inspiration of God, all scripture. The Bible is an inspired book. Now, many other books have been written, but most of the, but all of the other books that are written, they have gotten their foundations from the Bible. So you have to question anything else that is written unless you have the Bible. The Bible is the book, it is the standard. You need a standard. It's just like your, 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 you, know, you have time on your cell phone, you got time on your watch, you have time on your clock radio in your car, but there is a standard of time uh, over in, I believe it's London, England or somewhere over there, there's the standard time uh, that we have that, 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 that measures time accurately with the rotation of the earth and all of that. So you have to have a standard in everything that you do. We need a standard in our measurements, you know, so that 12 inches is 12 inches. We need a standard so that one pound is one pound. That's why every now and then when you go to buy your gasoline, there's a sticker on the gas pump that says it has been checked back to the Bureau of Measures and Weights and Measures. There's a standard so that a gallon is a gallon. And the same is true with our spirituality. Uh, the Bible is our standard, not some book that some man like me has written, but the Bible is the standard, all right? And when you use the Bible as a standard, all of our conflict and issues will go away. If the Jesus is our focus, he'll put us all together so that we'll be of the same mind and of the same judgment. So now, let us talk for just a moment about possessions. And now let's, let, let's, let's, let's look at it this way. <clears throat> Material possessions. All human beings want some type of material possession. All right, now the subject that we have is avoid your possessions possessing you. Avoid your possessions possessing you. All of us at some point, you have a possession that will possess you. It will control you. You have to have it. At least you think you have to have it until it's taken away from you. 
We have something in our lives that we, we have, that we just got to have. But I can name one that just about everybody, uh, almost on, in the world, and that's a cell phone. A cell phone is a possession that we all feel like we just have to have. And if we leave it somewhere, we, we're going to find that cell phone. We just have to have that possession. But there, there's, there are possessions that all of us want. That's, that's human nature. That's human nature. That's human nature. Uh, there's some level of desire for every human on earth that's common to all of us. Remember this, we all are human beings. That's something we need to understand. That's the only way we're going to even solve that Middle East crisis over there is we got to look at everybody as a human being. Stop this calling people animals and calling them things that they are not and things that are, that are malicious and using pernicious vocabulary. We are all human beings and we all have desires. Let me tell you, there's one desire that we all have. Every human being walking on the face of the earth wants to have the right of self-determination. The right of self-determination. In other words, make decisions for yourself. You don't want somebody, I don't want somebody else telling me what I have to do. Now, what I may do may be wrong in the eyes of the Creator, in the eyes of the Godhead, but I, I do want the right to, to make that choice on my own. I don't want somebody else to force me into that. That's one thing about uh, the Church of Christ. We don't try to force people into doing what the Lord says. If you don't want to do it, you know I can't make you do it. No other human being can make you do it. You have to desire to do it. And when you desire to do it, then you more than likely will do it. It's just, this is like your children. There comes a time as you're raising your children, you'll find uh, that you can't force them to do what you like for them to do. They may act like they're doing what you ask them to do, and then as soon as you are gone or they're away from you, they'll do what they want to do. We all have the desire of self-determination. And until we understand that, we're going to always have conflict going on. I want you to do what I do, but I don't want to do what you do. No, no, no. We all have a desire for self-determination. We all desire possessions. Now, let me say this. Let's talk about this for a moment. There is nothing wrong amassing possessions, okay? You know, gathering possessions. Nothing wrong with that. Uh, such re blessings as uh, such uh, possessions as property. There's nothing wrong with owning property, okay? Uh, nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with owning material goods, you know, clothing, your shoes, your, you know, your, your, your wearing apparel, uh, your, your, your living uh, situation, your furniture, uh, your, your house, your jewelry. There's nothing wrong with material goods. There's nothing wrong with wealth. Nothing, nothing wrong with, with wealth at all. As a matter of fact, uh, the Godhead made uh, many of the biblical characters wealthy. Solomon was wealthy. Abraham was wealthy. Isaac was wealthy. Jacob was wealthy. They all were, they had a certain amount of wealth. So Solomon had tremendous wealth. Uh, you, you, go back, well, you can go back to Adam. Adam had wealth likewise. He had the best of living conditions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He had the best of living conditions. In fact, Adam didn't even have to work for his food. It was provided for him. Uh, symbolically, figuratively, he had a refrigerator that was full of food. He didn't have to put it in the refrigerator. It was already there. Everything was there, symbolically. That means that he didn't have to go out and dig in the ground until he violated the Godhead. When he violated the Godhead, you notice I use the Godhead because I want to bring into this picture God the Father, Christ the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They all are in the Godhead in the, in the beginning. As a matter of fact, they all existed. God the Father, Christ the Son, and the Holy Spirit existed before the beginning 
was the beginning. They were in the beginning. In the beginning, God. In the beginning was the Word. In the beginning, the Spirit moved upon the face of the waters. So they existed before the beginning was the beginning. So there's nothing wrong with amassing material property and material goods and wealth. Christ, in his parables, probably 20% of his parables dealt with possessions of some sort. Uh, it might have been in the area of food. It might have been in the area of raiment or clothing. It might have been in the area of, 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 of uh, uh, minerals, uh, gold and silver. But he dealt with possessions in his parables. Now, let me give you four reasons for the frequent material possession teaching by Jesus. See, Jesus taught frequently. Now, there's some reasons of why he taught on a frequent basis concerning uh, material blessings. One is, and let, let, me, let me just give you some, one, some key words here. One is acquisition. I'll just put up here the word acquisition. Acquisition. In other words, acquisition of wealth is prominent among many people. We all try to acquire possessions. We want a car. We want nice furniture. We don't just say furniture. We want nice furniture. We want good cuisine, good food. We want, you know, we want jewelry. We want excellent hairdos. We want, see, we all try to acquire wealth in some ways and possessions. And so that's why Jesus dealt with it. Another reason why Jesus dealt with it, because number two, it is important, important, okay, at water important to who? Number one, it's important to the individual. Remember that now. Also, it's important to the society. In other words, there are some things we want as individuals, and then there are some things we want as a society. What do we want as a society? Well, right now we want clean air, don't we? in our environment. We want good highways to drive on. Uh, we want a, a ready uh, food supply. So there are things that we want as a society we try to acquire. There are things, we want safety and security. That's why we got all these people buying guns. You know, we've got 300 million people in the United States, 330 million people in the United States of America, but we got 400 million guns out there. Isn't that amazing? We, we got almost a gun and a half for every, um, every citizen walking the street. And, and, you know, that's a sin and a shame that we, that we have to, a, a country as blessed as we are, but we got to have that many guns on the street. And we still, many still, <clears throat> excuse me, do not feel safe and secure. Not only do we have the guns, we got the dogs, we got the chains, we got the locks, we got securities on our cars, security in the house, security in the garage, security out on the lawn, lights shining, everything. We got security everywhere. We got cameras on the street corners, cameras in the garage, cameras everywhere, and we still don't feel secure, all right? But uh, it is important, one reason why Christ taught on this, because it is important to the individual, me as an individual, you as an individual, it's also important to society. Another reason that Christ taught on possessions so frequently is acceptance, all right? Acceptance. Acceptance of what, Brother Atwater? Acceptance of what? Acceptance of the Lord's redemptive concepts is hindered 
by our quest for riches. In other words, when you have that strong desire for possessions, it creates a stumbling block toward your acceptance of the Lord's concepts. Okay? When you want something material, sometimes you will violate the Lord's concepts. That's why some people steal. They can't buy it, so they steal it. Some people, uh, they want it so bad that they have to work on the Lord's day instead of worshiping on the Lord's day. One thing that, 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 really, that really hurts my heart is I'm on my way to worship on the Lord's day, and I see people out washing the car, cutting the grass, painting the house, washing windows, walking the dog. They walk the dog on Sundays, but will not walk the children to worship on the Lord's day. It's amazing, okay? So that's another reason why the Lord taught it so, so frequently, is acceptance of his concepts as opposed to what your wants are. Another reason that the Lord taught it, I'm going to give you a fourth reason, is experience. You know what? The Lord is an expert in economics. He created ec economics, he experienced economics, and he is aware of the result of economics. The Lord is an economical expert. As a matter of fact, the Lord knows how to multiply. The Lord understands supply and demand, demand and supply. The Lord understands uh, the, 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 the transfer of goods and services, the providing of goods and services. In fact, God is referred to as Jehovah Jireh. He provides for humanity. So the Lord understands economics. As a matter of fact, Joseph, the patriarch Joseph in the Old Testament made Egypt rich. E Egypt did not get rich on its own. Egypt got rich because of Joseph. That's God's man was taken there as a slave as an, on an Israelite caravan and he was actually imprisoned. And he rose ultimately to become second in command in Egypt. And he built the wealth of Egypt, all right, out of God's goodness. So experience. So the Godhead is experienced with economics. And that's why Jesus taught on it, because the Lord knows how economics work, okay? Jesus also taught something else about earthly wealth. Now, as these are the four reasons why it's so prominent in the teachings and the ministry of Jesus. The acquisition side, it's important to individuals as well as society. Acceptance of his concepts can be hindered, so he taught on it. And then, of course, he's experienced in economics. Now, he taught that earthly possessions, remember this class now, he taught that earthly possessions, earthly possessions, are lower in priority than are our individual salvation. Individual salvation is priority, whereas our, uh, our earthly possessions, they are secondary. As a matter of fact, there's a passage of Scripture that Christ said in his Sermon on the Mount in, the, in Matthew chapter 6, where he said, Seek ye first. Now, that's a priority. He didn't say seek second or third, but he said seek first the kingdom of heaven and its righteousness. Let me say that to you again. You can write that down, Matthew 6, 33. Seek first what? The kingdom of heaven and its right. That's the same thing as the church, all right? See, some people say, well, the church is not important. I'll take Christ, but I don't need the church. No, you cannot have Christ without the church, and you cannot have the church without Christ. You got to have them both, Okay. They're, 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 they work together, hand in glove. And as a matter of fact, the church is the bride of Christ. The church is the body of Christ. The church is what Christ is. It is uh, the church represents Christ on earth. All right? He's coming back for the church. 
He's not coming back to set up a kingdom again. The church is the kingdom. The church is a component of the kingdom. There's the, there's the, there is the earthly component of the kingdom. There's the heavenly po- component of the kingdom. When you, in order to get to the heavenly component, the, one, the, 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 the heaven where God reigns, where Christ is, you've got to come through the church. The church cleans you up. It recycles you. It saves you. You fellowship in the church. You worship in the church, getting ready for the heavenly part of the kingdom. All right? So he gives us that priority now. That priority is that your possessions are lower than your salvation. You Got to understand that. That's, that's part of the economics as well as the salvation side of Jesus. Okay? Something else that Jesus did, he, 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 he shared this with us in his ministry, is that excessive uh, possessions tend to produce two dangers, all right? There are two dangers that occur with excessive uh, ownership of pos- possessions or excessive desire for material possessions. Two dangers. Danger number one. Now watch this real closely now. It, bl- it blunts your social conscience of relationship with others. In other words, it, 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 it causes you to decide who you're going to build your relationship with. See, sometimes if somebody <clears throat> has sometimes when people have more than what I have, then I won't associate with them. If somebody has less than what I have, I don't want to associate with them. So in other words, possessions can play a role in how we relate to other human beings. That's just like what's going on over there now in the Middle East right now. The Israelis, they have more possessions than the Palestinians. The Palestinians are living a very sorrowful, a very malicious kind of hurtful life from what I've read, from what I've read and what I've heard. Therefore, there is a relationship problem occurring because of possessions. And let me tell you what the number one possession is. I'm going to write that right up here. Possession. The number one possession that causes more problems on a society basis is property. Another way to put it, land. Land ownership. All right? Just remember that thought. Secondly, the second danger of excessive possessions is the power, our, our willpower is weakened. When you have a lot of stuff, your willpower is weakened. If you got a nice, comfortable chair, and you're enjoying your chair, and you got plenty food to chill out, you don't think about attending Bible study. It becomes less of importance. But when things are taken away from you, all of a sudden, you shift gears on what is important and what is not important. So, look, two things. Excessive, remember this class, excessive possessions affect us two ways. It blunts our social conscience of relationship with others. And then number two, it affects our willpower to deal with temptations. There's a song we sang, Yield Not to Temptation. And one reason why we yield to temptation is because of possessions. The ability to possess, the ability to acquire, the ability to obtain things that are of lesser import. Let me me give you a passage of Scripture. Turn over with me to the book of Mark. Mark chapter 10. Now, I haven't gotten into the text yet, but I'm going to get into that in just a moment. But go to the book of Mark. In Mark chapter 10, class, give you time to flip over there. And let's see, let's look at verse number 17. <clears throat> verse number 17, there is, the, there is the 
dialogue there of what is called the rich young ruler. Uh, let, 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 let's, just, let's just read this passage uh, together here, beginning with Mark chapter 10 and verse number 17, where it says, And when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him. This is Jesus, by the way. And kneeled to him and asked him, said, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Everybody wants to have eternal life. Everybody, you, you know, everybody that's living, they want to maintain their life. They don't want to be killed. They don't want to die. And they shouldn't die. Another human being should not kill another human being. Period. I don't care who you are. You have, you have no right whatsoever to kill somebody, whether you like them or not. You have no right to kill them because you cannot return the life that you take. Okay? All right, he said, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Verse 18, and this is what the teacher said. Jesus is the teacher. He's the teacher. The Bible says, why callest thou me good? There is none good but one that is God. And then in verse number 19, Jesus begins to explain. In the Old Testament, thou knowest the commandments. He said, now you've been reading the, the Old Testament. Now obviously you can't read the New Testament because you don't have it yet. But you've been reading the Old Testament at this point. This is the first century, by the way. And he's saying, but you have been reading the Torah. You've been reading the prophets, all right? What does it say? It says that uh, do not commit adultery, all right? You know, it's amazing how we can talk about homosexualism, bestiality, Incest, but nobody ever says anything about adultery. Well, adultery is just as bad as all the rest of them. Line them all up, okay? Do not commit adultery. Do not kill. Are we killing folk? I believe we've had over 560 some odd mass murders in the United States just, just this year. Yes, well, yeah, we kill. But what does it say? Do not kill. Do not steal. Do we steal? I believe one store just about went out of business uh, because of people stealing. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. We got people in, even in our government that lie on people in the government. Do not bear false witness. Don't defraud. Defraud not. Watch this one. Honor thy father and mother. So Jesus just simply went back and pulled some of the concepts in the old covenant, okay? All right? And so he answered and said unto him, oh, Master, all these have, I've observed. In other words, I've done all of these from my youth. So, so in other words, you know, in other words, you know, you, 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 give me an answer. I, I've done this stuff. I've done, I've done this. I've done this stuff. You know, a lot of people say, you know, I'm, I'm a pretty good person. I haven't done any of these. All right? Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him and said unto him, now here's where the real the rubber meets the road. See, th this is this is why. This is why the N Old Testament is written for our learning. All right, but the New Testament is written for our redemption, sal salvation, and reconciliation, justification, sanctif sanctification. Uh, our inheritance is all tied up in the in the New Testament. All right, look at this response. One thing thou lackest. Well, what do you lack? What do you like, young man? Go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast. Give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. And come, take up the cross, and follow me. That's the, that's the answer to Jesus. After all, after, after all of that talk about what was in the Old Testament, the Lord said, now, sell, all you, sell everything you got, rich man. You, you're rich now. Sell all you have. Give it to the poor. Let me say that to our billionaires and millionaires. Learn to give to the poor. Quit trying to get your taxes cut. Pay some taxes. So we can help. There's no reason why any child in the United States of America should go to bed hungry at any time throughout any year. Period. Those who have, sell what you have and give to the poor. Some, some people say, well, I, 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 I give, I give, I give. You don't give enough. You have too much, 
you don't give enough. All right? He says, sell what you have, give to the poor, and you should have treasure in heaven. Come, take up the cross. In other words, take up my communication. Take up my opportunities. Take up my teaching and my salvation. Become a part of my body, which is the church, and follow me. That was the answer that Jesus gave. That's what I call a New Testament answer. See, Jesus is in the transition between the Old Testament and the New. And he's getting him ready for the New Covenant, which is a better covenant. And then in verse 22, look what the young man said. Now, this is just what the young man said. And he was sad at that saying and went away grieved for he had great possessions. See, in other words, his possessions hindered his, his ability to, uh, to, to accept the concept of Jesus. It was all because... Now, think about this for a moment, Claire. Let, let, let's back off for a moment. Let's suppose the young man would have sold all that he had and had given it to the poor. Do you know that Jesus has the power to give it back to him and double it? Do you all remember? Let's go back to, let's go back to the Old Testament for a concept. All right. Remember the case of Job? Job lost everything that he had. But Job refused to turn his back on the Godhead. And when it was all over, Job ended up with more in the end than he had in the beginning. Okay? See, when you follow the economics of the Godhead, the Godhead is eternal in its nature, whereas the material possessions that you have are satanic in their nature, and they're only temporary as long as the Lord allows them to exist. Okay? All right, now. Let's, let, let, let's go a little further. Let's take a look at our text as we come to the climax of this lesson. Let's look at Luke chapter 12 for a moment. Turn with me to Luke chapter 12. <clears throat> Luke chapter 12. And uh, let's begin at verse number 13. Here we have another parable of Jesus. <clears throat> Jesus used parables because it, it, it is difficult to relate spiritual things to fleshly people. I'm fleshly. And it's hard for me to understand the spiritual realm when I have never been to the spiritual realm, but I'm living in the fleshly realm. All right? So Jesus used parables to help us to understand and correctly interpret what his message was. So in this verse 13, the Bible says, And one of the company said unto him, Master, this is uh, Luke chapter 12 and verse number 13. He says, And one of the company said unto him, Master, speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. Now look, look here. Right off the bat, you got an inheritance. You know what it's like when, when there's an inheritance and the family gathers around. There's always a fight. There's always fussing. There's always a fallout. There's always complaining. What about me? What am I supposed to I wanted that. He told so-and-so before they died said that was going to be mine. That's mine. That's mine. You know, many times people don't have a will. They don't have it all spelled out. Even when they have it spelled out, you still have an argument. Oh, I don't believe it. You know, he didn't say that and all this kind of You know, it's amazing what an inheritance or possessions will do to people. I've seen people lose just about all of their inheritance because of arguing, because of fussing and fighting. Nobody gets it. You know, it's better to get something, get a little something, than to get nothing. Isn't, isn't that right? It's better to act decent. Even if somebody else gets more than you, it's better to get something than to get nothing. Okay? But yet and still, here's the, here's the, here's the man, he says to, the, to Jesus, he said that he will divide the inheritance with me. Verse 14, and he said unto him, and this Jesus said, Man, who made me a judge or a divider over you? And he said unto them, Take heed, 
Now watch this now. Here's another word that comes into play. Be aware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. Your life is not tied to your possessions, all right? Brother, well, how, how do you know that? How, how, how would you say that? Well, here's the way I would say it. When you go to the cemetery where all the dead people are, I don't see any of their possessions at the cemetery. You know, it's amazing at the cemetery, everybody looks alike. I see dirt, grass, everything looks the same. Grass is green, the dirt is brown. As a general rule, brown, red, or black, or whatever. Dirt is dirt. Grass is grass. And then we as human beings put some flowers on top of all of that. So really, when you go to the cemetery, everything is in the hands of the almighty creator. The house that we live in, the body, goes back to the earth from which it came. And, every, and then the spirit goes back to God. So it's not the possessions where life is. Life is in God and in the, is in the soul of human beings. Okay, now... Let, 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 let's, let's, let's just deal with this, this particular teaching of Jesus in a little more detail. The man asked a question, though he was really not desiring to please the Lord. See, he, see sometimes people ask a question just to see what somebody is going to say, but they don't intend to do what the answer is or what to say. So some people come to church just to, just, just to see, but they don't come to obey, all right? Some people come to church just, to, just for tradition, but they don't come to try to get their lives in a new condition. They want tradition, but not condition. And, that, and, and, that, and that, that's really, really the case. And that's the case with this man. Now, the Lord used, now watch this now. The Lord used his crooked intention to teach on covetousness. See, sometimes the Lord will use our flaws to teach on faith. Sometimes the Lord will use our curiosity to teach on caring for one another. See, sometimes the Lord will use our shortcomings to help us to shift over into a long-term life living. All right? The man's life does not consist of the abundance. See, Jesus starts right out. He said, man's life does not consist in the possessions that he has. Life is more than a physical existence. That's the second thing Jesus wants to get across. See, in other words, life is not just physical. There's a spirit. Life is spiritual. We are measured. Now watch this very close. I want you to write this one down now. We are measured Ah. Uh, by what we are, not what we possess. Let me say that again now. We are measured by what we are, not by what we possess. There are some people that are very, well, they're billionaires. Look at our former president. He claimed to be a billion heir. But he's not. That's being, that's, that's being proven. He's defrauded the government. He's defrauded the banks. He's defrauded society. He's defrauded all of us, as a matter of fact. He's highly visible, a bad example for our young people. So many people are following him, but he's a bad example for our youth on how to conduct ourselves with our material possessions. All right? So it's, we are measured by what we are and not what we possess. And you know what? What you possess will not be around long. It's temporary. It can be stolen. It can wear out. It can rust out. Time takes its toll on our possessions, okay? 
True well living comes from the Godhead and its, its provisions. In other words, the Godhead gives us what we call the well-being lifestyle. The Godhead, okay? Now, let's deal with covetousness for a moment. Covet covetousness, all right, if I can say it. Covetousness is a sin, all right? Let's turn with me to 1 Timothy. Let's go over a little further. Paul wrote 1 Timothy as he was writing a letter to his young assistant in the gospel. 1 Timothy chapter 6. And let's start with verse number uh, 7 through 10. <clears throat> All right? 1 Timothy chapter 6. Here we're dealing with the use of our possessions or the use of wealth. And the Apostle Paul, remember this now. Some people say, well, you know, Paul is not that important. Yes, he is very important. Paul, what he received, he was inspired by Jesus. Jesus is the teacher. Paul is the vessel through whom Jesus sent his word, okay? All right, so what, what did Paul write? Paul wrote in verse 6, he says, uh, but godliness with contentment is great. Oh, Lord, let me, let me write that up here for you. We got to learn something. Contentment. In other words, whatever state we happen to be in, we got to learn to be content with that state as we work to improve our status. Let me say that again. Be content in your state until you can improve your status. And it takes patience in that move. Be content in your state until you improve your status, okay? So Paul says, but godliness with contentment. Now, watch this now. Be content and godly where you are. Notice what I said. You don't plot on how you're going to steal something or jip somebody out of something or try to get something too soon. When you get it too soon, the Lord will take it away from you, all right? Be godly with contentment in your state until you can improve your status. Important. Let me say it again now. I want you, I want to get, want you to get this class. Be godly, no, be content, but be godly in your contentment where you are. That means you worship in your con where you are. You serve the Lord where you are. You, 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 you ha have a Christ-like lifestyle where you are. And the Lord, before you know it, the Lord will bless you to rise above where you are. Now, if you're sitting there thinking about you know, having bad thoughts and envy and jealousy and acting ignorantly while you're in your state, then you're not godly in your state. Got that? All right. So that sets up. Verse 6 sets it all up now. Now, watch verse 7 now. Verse 7. All right. He, uh, Paul is doing some teaching here to young Timothy. He says, for we brought nothing into this world. That's true. Every baby that comes into this world don't bring a thing with it. The only thing a baby brings with it is a cry, a cry, and a bowel movement. That's what a baby brings. Nothing else. Okay? <laughs> All right. For we brought nothing into this world, and it's certain that we carry nothing out. Isn't it, isn't it interesting how that, let me put it this way. A baby comes into the world more or less in a fetal position. We leave this world more or less in a fetal position. You know, when, when one gets sick and so forth, you get in that fetal position. We come into this world with nothing and we leave this world with nothing but our soul. And that's why the soul and the, our lives, our spirit goes back to God that's why we want that to be righteous when we leave this world, all right? So now, so Paul says, for we brought nothing into this world, 
and it's certain that we carry nothing out. Certain, it's certain, it's certain. It, it, it's, no, it's no wishy-washy, no question about it. You don't carry anything out, okay? Now look at verse number 8. And having food and raiment, let us be what? Therewith content. Watch me now. Watch me. What, what did I tell you? If you got food, if you got clothing, and you got some mobility, be godly in your contentment. All right? Don't, 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 be, don't, don't, be, don't be plotting in your contentment. Don't be plotting. Be godly in your contentment. Don't, 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 don't be envious, but be godly. Don't be jealous, but be godly in your state. If you happen to have a large inheritance and you're sitting on four or five million dollars, be godly in your state. What do you do? Give to the poor. Help those that are less fortunate. Give the Lord a return on his investment in you because the Lord can take it all away from you. In fact, the Lord is going to take it all from you when you go to the cemetery. When you go to the cemetery, all of your possessions remain on earth. Everything you got remains on earth except your spirit which goes into God's control, Christ's control, the Holy Spirit's control for the judgment, waiting on the judgment. All right? Having food and raiment, let us be there with content. Then he says <clears throat> in verse number nine, but they that will be rich Watch this now. Fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drawn men in destruction and perdition. And then he closes in verse number 10. He says, For the love of money, that's possessions, is the root of all evil. Now money itself is not evil, but the love of money. And love there is ereo or lust of money. Lust of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith. In other words, they are not godly, not godly, erred from. When you err from the faith, you have not been godly. All right? And pierce themselves through with many. You get sorrowful. A lot of times when you wasted your money, you were not godly, then you're sorrowful because you should have done better than what you did, all right? So now, when you read those verses, as Christians, there's two things we got to focus on. L let me, let, let me kind of recap it like this. Number one, focus on how we get possessions, all right? Write that down. Focus on how we get possessions. Number two, focus on how we use our possessions when we get them. Focus on how we get them and focus on how we use them when we get them. All right? Now let's close with this thought. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 6 as we get ready to end this particular lesson. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus, as he presents in the middle part of his Sermon on the Mount, he says in verse number 20, watch this now, verse 20, he said, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal. Verse 21, for where your treasure is, there will your heart or your mind be also. Let me, let me give you four, four points to kind of close that out. That is that earthly treasures are transient, but heavenly treasures are eternal. Write that down. Earthly treasures are transient, but heavenly treasures are eternal. All right, let me give you number two. Earthly treasures steal the heart, but heavenly treasures seal the heart. S-E-A-L. Earthly treasures steal the heart, 
but heavenly treasures seal the heart. Right, let me give you a third one now. Earthly treasures blind our vision, but heavenly treasures provide moral and spiritual vision. Let me say it again now. Heavenly treasures blind our vision, but heavenly treasures provide moral and spiritual vision where you're able to see the unseen. See, okay. Now let's close with this one. The fourth one I want to give you. It is impossible to serve both God and mammon. Let me put it in street, street language. It is impossible to serve both the creator and your money or your possessions. Look at Matthew chapter 6, verses 24 uh, and 25. Yeah, verses 24 and 25. Look at verse 24. It says this, <clears throat> No man, that's man or woman, can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Look at verse 25. Therefore I say unto you, this is Jesus now. This, this, see, you got you to understand to, 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 uh, to accept the concepts of Jesus, our possessions many times blind us and we can't see these concepts. That's why you got to, your, 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 your possessions are secondary and tertiary to, to your salvation, which is primary. All right? So verse 25, Jesus says, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body. You know, you know sometimes we put more time in our fingernails and toenails than we do in getting the word in our mind. It's amazing the money that people spend going to the, to the saloon or wherever they go to get their toenails, the nails, and the hair done. The money and the time they spend and don't take a time to pick up the word and the concepts of Jesus. I'm not knocking you for do, taking care of your nails and your toenails, but let me tell you something. At least give the Lord equal time because he gave you those nails and those toenails. You can get to a point where you won't be able to even cut your toenails and your nails. Then what are you going to do? You need the Lord, all right? He says, now, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body. What ye shall put on is not the life more than me and the body than raiment. All right, class, may God bless you. Avoid your possessions possessing you, and the Lord will bless you. May God bless you. Let us have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this class, and we're thankful for these great, beautiful people that tune in with us from time to time and study with us. We pray that they are growing day by day, little by little, as they understand a little more of thy spiritual concepts to apply to their lives. Forgive us for the things that we have not done that we should have done. Bless us to begin to apply the principles to our lives. Help us to have love one for the other. Get rid of all the hate that is in us, the hostility, the anger, and the conflict. And let us begin to cooperate and learn to be godly and content in the state where we are as we, as we attempt to improve our status. These blessings we ask in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen, amen, amen. May God bless all of you, and we'll see you in the next Bible class. Amen.